Otherwise, you are giving the caliph or the emir a sweeping authority to do whatever they want under this pretext. And again, it will change to be another form of dictatorship. Um, and that's why Imam Malik, you know, when the ruler, uh, the caliph at the time, wanted to adopt his muwatta, he said, no, why do you want to restrict the Allah, that which Allah SWT has left open? Now, can there be a, t- a term limit or not? This can be open for debate. So let's say if there is term limit, then within this term limit, as long as the caliph functions in the right way, dis- discharges the responsibility in the right way, then that's fine. My name is Muhammad Jalal. Welcome to The Thinking Muslim. Since the demise of the Ottoman Caliphate, the Muslim world has moved from one crisis to another. The parlous state of this ummah is now subject of many discussions and numerous Islamic groups have attempted to find the magic formula to reverse this decline. Invariably and correctly, in my view, the subject of a return to Islamic governance has become a rallying call for many that seek to return to a place where the Ummah was a leading one. Yet recently, the rise of ISIS and the return to the Taliban government has given us two very different, yet for some very troubling models of how a Sharia-ruled state should run. Beyond these examples, contemporary Islamic study on the topic either negates well-known Islamic precedents found in our tradition or offers models of authoritarianism where a caliph has the control over all and is one step away from repression. Today we have brought together two Islamic thinkers and scholars that have been working for some time on rethinking Islamic governance. Ustad Iyad Hilal is no stranger to this show. He runs the al arkam Academy in California and is a regular Imam and Khatib at masajids across the state. Kamal Hussein is a lecturer and legal expert who recently delivered a paper to academics and scholars on the concept of Al-Sultan Al-Ummah, the authority of the Ummah. He argues that the Islamic principle has been lost over time, with many theorists viewing the role of the people as no more than passive citizens in a caliphate structure. Uh, Ustad Iyad Hilal Kamal Hussein, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. It's great to have you both with us uh, once again. Alhamdulillah, you've uh, uh, you've now uh, appeared on a regular basis on my podcast, and um, I think today's topic is is really critical, especially after recent events, uh, the Taliban takeover, as well as, of course, uh, the last few years we've had a lot of discussion in the mainstream media about ISIS and about Islamic government and about caliphate and. There are lots of experts and so-called experts that uh, discuss the caliphate uh, as if it's a it's part of their expertise. And so I've I've asked the two of you to come on because I know you've done a lot of study and research into Islamic governance and and how uh, and what is the 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 Sharia perspective on on governance in Islam. And and also I would like to get your viewpoints on uh, not only contemporary thought on Islamic governance, but of course also of a classical understanding of Islamic governance and uh, to clarify maybe some misunderstandings that I have and also my listeners have. Well, let's start with uh, the most recent reality, I think, the Taliban. So the Taliban uh, have uh, recently established what we call an Islamic emirate. And uh, I have a question here actually from one of my listeners. So I sent out a message to uh, my my, uh, uh, followers, I suppose, on Twitter and uh, a good number responded with uh, a good series of questions. And I've given you, uh, I've sent you some of those questions, and I've also got questions of mine. But Um Fateh asked a really interesting question. So I'm going to start with her question. Uh, and I will direct that to you, uh, Usadi Yad Hilal. Uh, and the question really is, is there a difference between Islamic Emirate and Khilafah or the Caliphate? And I suppose my question attached to that is, uh, we hear about the caliphate in classical Islamic discussions. But is there something called an Islamic emirate in, in any of the classical books or any of the, uh, the, the evidences that we can recall when talking about uh, Islamic governance? Thank you, uh, brother, for inviting me. Inshallah, uh, there will be some fruitful discussion coming out of this. Our uh, scholars, when they talked about al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyya, like Al-Mawardi, like others, 
in the past and in contemporary time, they talk about the caliphate because they defined caliphate to be a public, a general authority to conduct the affairs of Muslims. So by definition, caliphate is not restricted to one area. It's not confined to an quote-unquote nation state. Taliban, from the very beginning, said that their work is for Afghanistan. That's it. So it is within a nation state. So that's the paradigm which they function within. So they wouldn't announce it caliphate because caliphate and nation state don't work together. You want to have caliphate, you should go beyond the, this paradigm, this, the nation, nation state. So they came up with this term, emirate, we are just emara for that piece of land, for that area. So it's not for all Muslims, it's not even the starting for all Muslims, it's just for that area. And yesterday I was listening to uh, Muhammad Naim, you know, one of their uh, spokespersons. He was asked a question about, do you encourage people to migrate, to move to Afghanistan? His answer was no, because he said, wherever you go, you work for your own locality, your own area. Because if you want to carry it out to people, uh, you have to be aware of their culture, of their language, of their norms, so you cannot come. Now, I'm not going to discuss his view, but rather it's very clear that his view is based on this paradigm, nation state. So it is an Afghani Imara. It is not going to be an uh, Islamic caliphate. And, and is that a problem from an Islamic perspective? So, um, I mean, maybe this raises a question about what is the caliphate? Because um, I can't imagine Afghanistan could be a caliphate. It's a poor country. It's a, a war-torn country. Um, uh, you know, if, if, even if they desired for it to be a caliphate, it, it would be impossible for that state, I would imagine, to shoulder the burdens of the Muslim ummah and, and shoulder the burdens of, of Islam as a, as a, a universal faith. Um, but is there a problem with the term Islamic emirate? In the, in the absence of the Islamic caliphate, if some people in any area uh, think that, okay, they want to establish this form of governance for, for their own, for themselves, you know, you cannot tell them, don't do it. The, the question emerges, if there will be uh, an Islamic caliphate coming down the road, number of years, let's say, uh, how are, is it going to deal with this emirate? And jurists uh, talked about this. So it's either they will accept to join or not. If they accept to join, it's over. If they don't accept to join, then the verdicts taken in their courts, as long as they are based on Sharia, if they are carried to a Qadi, to a judge in the Islamic Caliphate, then the, the Qadi in the Islamic Caliphate is bound to execute the rule which is taken by another Qadi in that dar, in that domain. So, so when, you, when you talk about Islamic scholars have spoken about states which do not have a formal affiliation to the caliphate, uh, those states can still implement the Sharia. And so the title Islamic Emirate can apply to those states? Um, they call it in this case, if that area did not join the authority of the caliphate, they call it the rules of the courts, as long as they are based on Islam, can be implemented in Darul Islam. So Dar al-Islam, the caliphate, Dar al baghi is the area that is outside the domain of the caliphate. Can we call Afghanistan and the Taliban government, uh, can we say that they've established Dar al-Islam? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Just, just from a, a practical perspective, um, you know, I think the Taliban themselves would say that um, they are not, um, they, are, they don't call themselves a khilafah. They, they say we are imara. Uh, and so in the context of that claim uh, and the context of, you know, the practical sort of reality, in the absence of the Khilafah, um, there's a fiqh discussion about Ahlul Baghi 
uh, where you have a rogue uh, Amir who's not following the authority, uh, the central authority or the Khalifa, that would be Ahlul Baghi. But to be Ahlul Baghi, you need a Khilafa in the first place. So in the absence of a Khilafa, um, the sort of from a practical perspective, what I would say is that they are claiming to be an Imara. Now, uh, the jury is out in terms of exactly what they mean by that. If we go by precedence, because it's not the first time uh, the Taliban have had power uh, in Afghanistan, it looks like a, another nation state. And we've had seen these uh, Emirates, you know, you have the UAE, you know, United Arab Emirates. These are a, a group of Amirs uh, who, in, you know, formed uh, uh, this, this entity. And, and in fact, if you look at the Gulf, uh, a lot of these countries are, you know, they're all sort of similar in that respect, that they are an Imara. But the question now is, um, you have Muslims who have, um, you know, repelled the aggressor. Now they, they are independent, the country is in their hands, the land is in their hands, the security is in their hands. The question now is, uh, will they implement Islam or not? And that surely uh, is an opportunity. And if they were to be able to implement Islam uh, within their ability, because you can't have a Darul Islam uh, without Khilafah. You can't have Khilafah without Darul Islam if you go by the fundamentals of what Darul Islam is. Uh, you do need security to be in the hands of Muslims and you need to apply Islam. Um, so, you know, that is essential for you to have Khilafah. However, you can have Darul Islam uh, in the absence of Khilafah, which we, we don't have a Khilafah now, where the security in the hands of the Muslims and then Islam is applied and, and, and established in those lands. So um, the question now really is, how is it applied? Is it applied? Uh, and, and, and really that detail uh, is yet to be seen. Um, in terms of their structure, um, you know, it's, it's called an imara. But the thing is, what does that mean? I think the substance, uh, you know, we haven't seen anything written in terms of what that means and obviously practically we will see it going forward so i think um uh, the question now is you know for us to really present a discussion about how a darul islam uh, would look like in terms of application of sharia well let's talk about the sharia now the taliban say that they are implementing sharia but of course they're implementing hanafi fiqh but a very a subset of Hanafi fiqh, Hanafi fiqh as interpreted by the Delbandi school, a school that's based in India, and of course uh, many Muslims uh, in Afghanistan follow this, uh, this, these sets of legal codes. However, this is not shared by everyone in Afghanistan. You have uh, those who adopt different madhahib and those who uh, are from different uh, perspectives, uh, apart from the Delbandi perspective. How can an Islamic government establish its uh, credibility over a people that may have different interpretations of the deen, which are valid interpretations? Kamal? I mean, if you look at fundamentally what ruling is about, and we'll come to the madhab issue uh, in a moment, um, uh, it, it, it's about dispensing of justice, and dispensing of rights that's you know and that's across the board whichever madhab you go to fundamentally that's the responsibility of the ruler because the quran is very clear uh, you know when it says so the, the verse um, says that allah SWT has commanded that you fulfill the amanat fulfill their rights, uh, uh, you give the amanat to those to whom it is owed, i.e. the hukuk and the rights to whom it is owed, and that when you rule the people, that you rule by justice. So justice and rights go hand in hand. In fact, even the definition of justice, uh, adl, is i'ta'ul haq ila sahibi, is to give the right to whom it is owed. So that, that so the ruler, when you know, when the ruler is um, dispensing justice, he needs to take account of the people's affairs and their interests and their well-being. The, the laws are not necessarily Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki. Perspective is actually, how do I look after the affairs of the people? Now, uh, 
when looking after the affairs of people, the ruler only engages those matters where there will be khilaf or there will be a problem. So the ruler should not actually adopt on the Hanafi fiqh or the Shafi fiqh or the Maliki fiqh uh, because the role of the ruler is not to dictate to people how they pray and how they fast. The issue is as long as they live by Sharia, this is the fundamental thing. And as long as their interests and their rights are looked after, where there is a clash, that's why the principle says, Amrul Imami, Yarafa'ul Khilaf. The order of the Imam will, will remove the disagreement or the dispute. Where there's no dispute, the Imam should not actually intervene and, and you know, force people, uh, even on controversial matters. If it doesn't affect ruling and it doesn't affect their rights and their interests, people are free to believe follow, uh, you know, even in Aqa, in, in belief, as long as it is within, uh, you know, the Islamic belief and, and ishtihad, they're uh, able to follow. Now, um, and that's why Imam Malik, you know, when the ruler, uh, the caliph at the time wanted to adopt his muwatta, he said, no, why do you want to restrict the Allah, that which Allah SWT has left open? So if you look at the provinces, each area had their own sort of fiqh that they were following. And that's not a problem. There's a purpose in terms of ruling, which is look after the affair. And there's a practical aspect as well. Sometimes when people look at ruling, they look at it very legalistically, uh, you know, or very literally. And then they forget that in dispensing justice, you have to be practical uh, and you have to look at the circumstances of the people. So if I were to go back to the, you know, the Dauband, uh, you know, uh, uh, question, that, you know, can you have a Hanafi uh, sort of fit within an area? Well, the question is, if that region is not Hanafi and you're forcing the Maliki fiqh, then you are restricting that which Allah SWT has kept open. However, if they're all Hanafi, then there's no harm in that region or that area following the Hanafi fiqh. Because the point is, a sectarian uh, madhab is where you dictate to everyone and you dictate in whatever you follow. So uh, even though it's got nothing to do with your ruling. Uh, so when the ruler adopts something, it has to be on the basis that it's resolving a problem within the ummah. It is uniting the ummah. It is dealing with uh, disputes and, and resolution of problems. Where it's a personal matter of difference of opinion, the ruler should not intervene. So, you know, so, uh, you know the question really is not Delban. The issue is, uh, even the Hanafi fiqh, if you apply the Hanafi fiqh, do you apply it in a blind, literalist way? Or do you apply it uh, with understanding of the fiqh, looking at the circumstances? And also, a, lo a lot of, you know, application of Sharia is actually, th there's a reality aspect to it, which is that there's a practical aspect, there's a pragmatic aspect, uh, and there's an issue of efficacy and, and, and are you realizing the goals of you know, looking after their affairs. And that requires, you know, a rational approach. So there's some, and then this I find is a problem. So the question is not necessarily the, for me, the one, the madhab, is really how is the fit being applied? Are we really looking at the issues and what the problems are and relating the fit to the problems at hand, you know, to improve the, uh, you know, the condition of people? Because the Sharia did not come to make life difficult. You know, uh, Allah SWT says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The Sharia is actually, we have not sent you a messenger except as a mercy. So the Sharia is a mercy. Whichever fiqh you go to is there to resolve our problems and improve the condition of the people. And following on from that, uh, Brother Yad Hilal, um, there's a question I have from uh, Brother Talha, who's, who talks about the extent of the control of an Islamic government or how much an Islamic government can exert on personal matters of citizens, for example, dress code, for example, the personal affairs involving sins, uh, for example, having uh, weddings with mixed gatherings uh, or different forms of violations of hijab or family law, for example. How much of that, so if we were to list those issues, how much of that will be subject to some level of state uh, implementation, uh, how much of it will be a worry of the state and how much of that will be left to 
the individual and his taqwa and his adherence to his own mad madhab. Um, yes, this issue opens, and the question before opens an important topic. What is the role of the caliphate? Is it to establish what is called in the West a big government? Big government means that a government will micromanage all of the affairs of each and every single person. Is it also to be the only tool to implement the Sharia? Does the Sharia depend on its implementation? on the iron fist of the state or, or the caliphate. So these issues, what is the role of the ummah participation uh, in, in this affair? We need to, to, to answer these questions. To summarize, the Islamic caliphate is not a big government. Although it is responsible, it carries the responsibility, but this responsibility is not away from the responsibility of the ummah at large and the individuals. So the ummah has a role, the individuals have a role, the government or the caliphate ha, 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 has a role. The implementation of Islam in all of this depends on the intern internalization of people to this ahkam sharia. The Islamic government or state or caliphate will not function in the right way if it turns to be a police state. Go to each and every single person to make sure that each and every single person will implement this or that. So the implementation of the Sharia comes at different levels. At one level comes the uh, responsibility of the caliphate. As an example, when it comes to the ibadat, it's on the individuals, within the individual's responsibility. When it comes to transactions among people, it, 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 the implementation is the responsibility of both sides of such transactions. The state, however, will just monitor or quote unquote observe or oversee that making sure that this mechanism functions smoothly. And then there is an area which is the sole responsibility of the caliphate or, or the state or the government. Qamat al-Hudud, as an example, implementing the penal code, uh, establishing the judiciary, making sure that no one will implement the law on their own, but rather within the judiciary. Uh, external affairs, Muslim, uh, the, the caliphate with other political entities, international community. This is the responsibility of, of the government or the state or the caliphate. But even there on this, the state will not be able to function smoothly if it is separated from people. So there must be this public participation uh, through direct interaction through uh, allowing political groups functioning uh, through public debate, all of this to make sure that uh, you are minimizing the role of the caliphate. But at the same time, uh, there was a statement said by Umar bin Khattab and the way he practiced actually, we know that uh, the statement he was saying, I swear by God, if a lamb or if a goat crumbled in the north of Iraq, I will be worried about. Maybe I'll be asked about it in the Day of Judgment, why I did not make the path plan for, for that goat. We have Umar Khattab's story when he used to walk at night to oversee the affairs of people. But that's not micromanagement. That's uh, the point. It was making sure, because he is the imam, was the imam and the imam is the ultimate responsible at the end the responsibility and it's also on him he can't claim well i'm the only person who i cannot see uh, oversee all of this no there must be a system apparatus established to make sure that everything is is, is okay and another third example in the yani, in the days of umar bin abdul aziz yani they corrected the zakah you know the fund was good enough to uh, address uh, people's needs and people's poverty. So he was he used to order the governors to go at the top of the mountains to just throw the, the seeds of, of wheat or corn or any of those grains so that the birds will eat. I don't want a bird to be hungry in the Khilafah. There is responsibility on the Caliph 
there is also equal responsibility on the Ummah. The Caliph will not be able to function without the Ummah, and the Ummah needs, needs the Caliph to oversee. There are things related to the public order, and there are things related to the private life. When it comes to the public order, it is the domain in which you know, the system or the caliphate will function. So if a person is having mixed uh, wedding privately, the state will knock their door to check on them, okay, how are you conducting the, your wedding? That's not the function, of, unless if you want to establish a police state, the Islamic state or the Islamic caliphate is not a police state. But if it comes to the public order, then the, 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 the caliphate or the judge or the governor or, or whoever uh, representing that, uh, the caliphate in that area must look at the case. Is there violation to the Hakam Sharia or not? Same thing applies to uh, the dress code. The dress code when it comes to the public life or uh, in private gatherings. A bunch of people get together, foreigners for each other, for each other and they did not observe the Islamic dress code, the, the Islamic caliphate or the Islamic state will not go and knock the doors. Oh, how are you dressed? But if it comes to the public order, the public order must be based on the public law. So, so I'm gathering from that that there is a public law which will effectively state uh, how, in this case, how a, 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 a woman would dress uh, in terms of her... her, her uh, of a need to cover, uh, to wear the hijab, and to, uh, and maybe even to, to you know, to wear more. But, uh, but like the abaya, but uh, there are uh, obvious differences of opinion, not on the hijab, not on whether the hijab is an obligation or not. I accept that, but there are differences of opinions on the style of the hijab. I note that the Taliban sent out a, a very rigid f- um, dress code for for women who go to universities, and you know. It 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 had to follow a particular uh, a particular even down to the measurements and the size of of the dress. Uh, would a would a caliphate go to that degree to monitor the dress of women in public? A caliph may decide to do that um, uh, and uh, to be that restrictive and 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 um, uh, to go to that level. However, what I would say is that um, following on, you know, from the previous discussion of what the caliph's role is um, and what the purpose is, because you know, ruling, there's a deliberate, deliberative process, yeah, that certain aims uh, are being sought. And the problem I find is when, you know, uh, when, when you talk about ruling or that it's seen as just a black and white, the rules that need to be implemented. The question really is that, yes, in the public sphere, uh, the rules, you know, uh, to do with morality and women's clothing, men's clothing and how they interact has to be according to our values and have, have to be open to Sharia. However, as long as they follow an Islamic opinion within whichever of the madahib, there is no need for the khalifa uh, to be so, um, you know, intrusive. So if, for example, a, a, you know, in the Hanafi madhab, you know, for example, the face is not um, actually aura. It's later uh, Hanafi fiqh, which said due to fear of fitna, that uh, that is wajib. Uh, so if a uh, person were to say that, look, I follow the opinion that covering the face is not wajib, there's no reason for the Khalifa now to dictate to people that this is how you have to uh, uh, cover because they are following the Sharia. Uh, it's not about following the madhab or the opinion of the Khalifa. It's about people following Sharia. And uh, whether you cover in a certain, you know, whether you wear the abaya or you cover the face or you don't cover the face uh, and, and, and the particular, you know, um, because there is a difference amongst the mother in terms of how much to what extent should be covered. Uh, as long as that is followed, that is sufficient for the purpose of maintaining uh, a wholesome and moral sort of atmosphere in society. And so the ruler should not do that. And the people have a right uh, if the ruler is punitive and restrictive and, 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 and dictating to people in their personal matters uh, what they follow uh, to actually raise this and say, you know, uh, you are now uh, in- engaging or entering an area 
which actually is you know beyond the remit of looking after the affairs and looking after Sharia. If there is a dispute and there's a problem in society, by all means, Amrul Imam Yarfa al Khilaf, the Imam should adopt an opinion and everyone is bound by that. If there isn't, the principle is that the Amir or the Khalifa does not uh, uh, you know, um, enter that sphere but allows the people to follow uh, their respective mazhabs and their opinions. I want to ask a question about, uh, you mentioned, and I think uh, Brother Iyad mentioned as well, the, uh, the, the exception uh, being public order. So if uh, a, an issue is to do with public order, then a Khalifa may adopt, even if that issue is uh, a, a personal issue, in order to resolve a dispute. Now, how far can that be stretched? Um, for example, if, if you take it to, to an extreme, uh, a Khalifa can, can cite that as a, like sometimes they do in liberal Western societies, they use security as a blanket concept to implement all forms of measures uh, that inhibit the lives of ordinary citizens. Can the Khalifa just use his public order clause to, for example, ban protests. I mean, the, the protests have come up recently in Afghanistan, and uh, there is now an edict from the central government that uh, no protests will be allowed because of public order. Uh, and so uh, it, it, is that now just we have to accept that? I mean, I heard uh, someone say that, you know, the, the judgment of an Islamic ruler has to be accepted. And so now we have to accept that we can no longer protest, even if that protest is for a right which the Sharia has has given us, um, Rabbi Yad, uh, what do you say about uh, about that? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran about obeying the ruler, "Atiu Allah, Atiu Rasul, wa Uli Al Amri Minkum." فَإِنْ تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرْدُوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ So the obedience to the ruler is not absolute. We need to realize this. The ruler came to the power by the public acceptance or by the people's uh, authority, Sultan al Ummah. So the ruler did not come to dictate and to enforce whatever the, he wants, not at all. And there can be a situation where we dispute. He doesn't have absolute role. That's why the ayat is, if you are disputing something with him, with the rulers, then refer it to Quran and Sunnah, refer it to the Hukum Sharia, not to Amadha. You ask public protest. Is it permissible for us to protest in public or not? That's the question which needs to be answered. If it is permissible, then the ruler cannot ban this by the pretext of the public order. I mean, the, by the public order, the public law, as an example, you talk about economy, you talk about the penal code, you talk about the rule, the, 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 how does the, how the procedures in the judiciary, how to manage the public ownership. This is a public order. Uh, it's not within the jurisdiction of the caliph to ban us from expressing our, our views. If I am expressing the view in that demonstration wrongly, then again, the caliph will come and say, okay, you are expressing non-Islamic ideas, so that's why I'm opposing, not opposing the public protest, I'm opposing the the, what you are calling for. Here we have dispute, then we go to the Hukum Sharia. I'm asking, well, if I'm asking something wrong or if I'm asking something right. If I'm asking something wrong, I should stay quiet. I accept, not because the Caliph has the authority to ban us from expressing our views. Otherwise, you are giving the Caliph or the Amir a sweeping authority to do whatever they want under this pretext. And again, it will change to be another form of dictatorship, which is not the goal of the Islamic governance. I, I, I want to ask you about that, actually, um, Rav Eyal, because um, at least from where, where I'm standing, when we look at Islamic history, uh, of course, Islamic history was complex and it had its, its uh, ups and downs. But generally speaking, all power did was bequeathed to a Khalifa and the Khalifa tended to have um, uh, all of the mandatory powers of the state under his control. Even if you look at some of the um, 
the works done by contemporary Islamic movements who, who talk about Islamic government or Islamic caliphates, they tend to talk about uh, the Khalifa being the manifestation of the state. And so the Khalifa can effectively do whatever they want to do. Um, uh, so if they wanted to uh, uh, ban uh, public demonstrations for public order, then maybe that's permitted. Or if they wanted to uh, to implement a very rigid dress code but, uh, that belongs to only one ishtihad and, and to negate other ishtihad, then that's perfectly acceptable. Okay, Barakallah Okay, in our literature, our Torah, there are things which uh, are established on clear evidences, not conclusive evidences, and there are issues which are not. And there are areas in which the Sharia was implemented, and there are areas in which the Caliph had no authority whatsoever. To come and say that the Caliph has absolute and general authority, power over people, uh, on what basis? On what basis we are saying this? We know as an example in the days of Omar ibn Khattab, he said, if people of Iraq keep asking me to change their governor, I will change their governor. Even before that, we go back to the days of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and no one will dispute his power and his authority. He used to keep people, local governors as governors. That happened in Oman, that happened in Yemen. So thinking of the caliph being the state and the state is the caliph. Once you have the caliph, you have the state and the whole state is shrinked to a caliph. This needs revision. This can be a historical a practice at some time. But uh, where is the responsibility of the ummah in this case? Where is the, part, uh, the public participation? The caliph does not have absolute authority. Well, I, I would like to talk about the ummah's role um, uh, very soon, but I want to just stick to this topic with w one last question, actually, and, and that is on um, in Saudi Arabia, for example, we know that until very recently, uh, you had a, a religious police and uh, they were responsible for um, uh, calling people or, or preventing people from abstaining from going to the masjid if they were in the public. So I remember when I uh, visited uh, on Umrah. Uh, I, I saw and I, I, I left the, um, uh, the holy precincts, I saw that um, when the Adhan went, the police came and, and, you know, even those people who had no inclination to pray the Jama'ah of, of the Salah, suddenly they had to close their shops and rush to the mosque. Uh, surely, I mean, one interpretation of that is surely that's a good thing because that's promoting the positive uh, behavior in society, like a parent would promote positive behavior in their kids, in their children. Uh, do you see that as a, as a, as a bad thing, uh, Rav Iyad? Well, it depends, again, on how do you build the relationship between people and between the caliphate. If, it is, if there is interaction between both, and there is, uh, let me use the word, uh, both of them are in the same board, and people have the internal conviction on the Ahkam Sharia, the role of this quote unquote public police will be very minimal. I lived in Riyadh. Maybe you don't believe it. We used to go and pray Maghrib, and the moment we leave the masjid, those police mata'a sitting there, they didn't join us in prayer. Yeah, okay, maybe they will pray later on, but you are adopting the opinion that says that Salat al Jama'a is far. So when people see this, and when people see there is double standard, they will oppose it. It will not work. But if people see that the spirit that Abu Bakr Siddiq demonstrated will lead to alaykum wa lastu bi I was chosen to be the wali, wali al-amr, upon you, and I'm not the best. Ati'uni ma ata'atullah fiqum. Obey me as long as I'm obeying Allah. If you are establishing this type of governance, then even if you have to have hisbah, in the Islamic judiciary, you have the hisbah. The hisbah is a court system responsible about the public souk, the public uh, life, You're watching the traffic law, watching uh, how people uh, transact, if there is uh, cheating or not, how people interact in the right way, or if there are people who are attacking others. If you are building the Islamic governance 
the way Abu Bakr Siddiq acted and Umar and the way Islam meant it to be, then the role of the Hizba or the police will be minimized. No, yeah, just to this point very quickly, inshallah. Um, I mean, historically, I think um, very early on, um, the, you know, the central role that the Ummah have in terms of ruling and authority was uh, unfortunately broken. Uh, so with the appointment uh, of Yazid uh, and the dynastic rule that followed for centuries and, and the classical fiqh, which focused on, uh, on the role of the caliph. If you look at the fiqh itself, it's actually all about the caliph and his roles and responsibilities. And these are legitimate discussions, but more fundamental before that, which is that, you know, what, that the, the caliph is actually an ajir, is, is actually someone who is hired by the ummah to fulfill an obligation that the ummah fundamentally has, which is to, uh, to live by Islam, to live by Sharia. And so therefore they appoint the Amir or the Khalifa to look after their affairs. And you find in the early period, as uh, uh, Abu Tariq said, uh, in Umar Khattab or Wakar, that's how they were. So when you uh, look at these demonstrations, for example, or protests, um, Umar al-Khattab would encourage it, you know, uh, in his day when someone stood up, uh, when he said, who will correct me? And a man uh, who was not a senior Sahabi, actually, just someone who was in the audience stood up and said, I will correct you. Umar al-Khattab, he said, La khayra fi, fikum in lam He said, there is no goodness or khair in you if you don't say it, if you don't account me. And he said, La khayra fina in lam nasma'ha. And there is no khair in us if we don't hear it. So the ruler who understands his role, actually he's been appointed by the people to look after their affairs by Islam, will want to encourage those who have dissenting views or different views in terms of how best to look after their affairs. Because the people are the custodians of the Sharia and it is they who appoint the ruler uh, to conduct and look after their affairs. So it's, you know, that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, revised as Abu Talib said. And we need to go back to the Asl, uh, which with the Khulafa al-Rashidun were. Khulafa al-Rashidun were not Rashidun only because they were Rashid and they were pious, but their rule was Rashid. The, 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 it's not only because they personally, they were just, but because their rule was just, and it, because it was for the purpose of looking after the people's affairs. Okay, so come on. What is the role of the people in a Sharia state? Um, now, in the West, um, there is a a notion of active participation, uh, where the people get involved with politics. Now, that may be through uh, elections, but but that's not enough for a liberal democracy. There needs to be uh, participation from the citizenry throughout. The period, whether that, that's participation in, in the general civic life of society, in the political life of society, but also participation in holding their rulers to account. Now, the liberal system um, uh, aims to create this wide participation. Uh, what is the aim of the Islamic system when it comes to the people? The intents and purposes, um, I think, um, you know, obviously different in terms of. Um, uh, in liberal democracies, um, as opposed to um, in, in an Islamic caliphate. Uh, liberal, liberal democracies, the engagement is there because the people are sovereign. So therefore, for them to recognize or realize that sovereignty, they need to have an engagement in government, in appointment of the rulers, in law, policy, etc., etc., in law enforcement, every aspect really, because the people are sovereign. Now, uh, in, in, you know, in, in terms of the Sharia, the way uh, we look at it, the conception really is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted or obliged uh, the Sharia uh, to the Ummah, first and foremost. So it is the Ummah's responsibility to ensure that they collectively as a society, as a people live by Islam. So the, you know, our source text, Quran, Hadith, if you look at the Quran, uh, in particular in terms of all the ayat relating to ahkam, um, the vast majority actually don't address the ruler. 
uh, you know, the, the, over 90 times you find the Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O you believe, uh, you know, kutiba alaykum siyam, or awfu bil uqud, many ayat like this. It's actually addressing the believers. Uh, and these ahkam uh, are the responsibility, actually, of the Muslims at large uh, to live by. Um, even actually, if you look at ayahs relating to hudud or uh, matters which are clearly uh, under the purview uh, of the ruler, even the khitab there, Quranic khitab or the address, is actually to the ummah at large. So when it says, as aydiyahuma. So, you know, in respect of the had punishment for theft, it says, فَقْتَعُوا. you know, the, the command in respect of amputation is فَقْتَعُوا, is actually plural to all Muslims. Uh, and, and we know uh, this is not something individual Muslims can engage in. It is actually the role and responsibility of the ruler. But why uh, address uh, the believers as a whole? Because it is, they are the custodians of the Sharia. And the way they realize that responsibility is by appointing an Amir, appointing a Khalifa, who will fulfill uh, that role. So it's from that perspective that actually the Ummah has a continuous uh, uh, relationship in ruling, because they have that responsibility to make sure that Sharia is applied. And that's why every aspect of governance, in fact, uh, you know, there's a concept uh, in, in, in uh, Islamic political theory uh, called Sultan Lil Ummah, that the sult Sultan or authority uh, lies with the Ummah. And deep within that is actually the sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the Ummah are responsible for applying the Sharia. So therefore, sovereignty of Allah and authority for, for Ummah, uh, uh, for the Ummah go hand in hand, and they're inseparable, because sovereignty of Allah cannot be recognized or realized without the Ummah's authority to ex and responsibility to execute that. Uh, and you can't have Sultan Lil Ummah without uh, sovereignty for Allah because the khitab or the address is to the Ummah to apply uh, the Sharia. So, from that perspective, every aspect, you know, if you look at the contract, uh, unfortunately, in the past, the, you know, the, the bay'ah or the contract where the uh, ruler is appointed, it's only seen in a, in a very sort of legalistic way, whereas that maqsad of Sultan Lil Ummah uh, has been lost. And in fact, uh, you can treat Sultan Lil Ummah as a maqsad for many of the aspects of ruling. So the bay'ah is not there. Bay'ah is not like a sale where, you know, two parties come together and the, you know, the counter values are exchanged and they depart. So X sells uh, a good and the money is given and they go. And, and, and they part ways. It's not like that. This is, uh, the contract here is that of a, like, wakala, wakil, that the ummah appoint the ruler in order to look after the affairs. And then there isn't a departure. That responsibility is continuous. So the ummah needs to ensure that the ruler fulfills that role. And the ruler needs to ensure that the people's affairs are looked after because that bay'ah contract is like a employer, employs an employee. You know, after employing, uh, the employer does not completely disappear from the scene. Uh, the Ummah are the actual employer of the Khalifa. If you look at, um, you know, now governing, um, you know, the Ummah doesn't appoint the ruler and then just leaves the rest to the ruler in terms of how they govern, no. So uh, how the ruler governs, uh, the Ummah has a say in that. Uh, so when you look at Shura, uh, you know, where... Uh, the Ummah has a right that the ruler consults them in their affairs, as the ayah says, وَشَّاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ That, you know, uh, commands the ruler that you should consult the people in their affairs, and the affairs should be based on shura. This also uh, epitomizes this notion of Sultan al-Ummah. If you look at siyasa, uh, which is looking after the affairs of the people through policies and, 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 and administration, um, Again, it's not for the ruler to suddenly, you know, just unilaterally decide these things and the people don't have a say in this. So, for example, in, with the COVID pan pandemic, so if there was a policy uh, the, that the caliph had adopted, which was, um, let's say, scientifically illiterate, yeah, so it wasn't based, founded on science, wasn't founded on 
a strong understanding of how this disease spreads. And the ruler um, does not take the necessary measures. People don't say, well, you know, we've appointed uh, the ruler and the, you know, he's fulfilling his task, even though people are dying as a consequence due to uh, the incompetence or the due to appreciation of uh, the problem, problem at hand. So the people actually have a role and responsibility uh, to engage the ruler on these matters and the ruler has to listen. And so there's an interaction, there's a constant interaction from the point in which the ruler is appointed until uh, the ruler uh, resigns, removed or, or, or his, um, uh, his term uh, or comes to an end, that the interaction continu is continuous between the people uh, and the ruler because that con contract is continuous. And that's the conception of, uh, of view towards um, engagement uh, in, or civic engagement. So our civic engagement is because we as an ummah have to live by Sharia and the person who we appoint to live by Sharia uh, has to fulfill that role to the best of his ability. And we have a say in how that is done because it is fundamentally our responsibility. So that's different from liberal democracy but the engagement and the participation is there. But, but of course, in liberal democracies, uh, there, is a, uh, there are ways by which a ruler can be sanctioned if not removed from office. Uh, yes, of course, constitutions in different countries have different ways and different methods to remove a ruler, uh, but there are ways to, uh, to remove that ruler from office. Uh, are you saying that in an Islamic government, uh, the people have the right to remove rulers? Well, um, even in the hadith, you mentioned um, uh, when the Sahaba asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, awala nuna bidhum, that shall we not rebel or fight the ruler? Yeah, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded that no, we need to obey illa an taraw kufran bawaha until and unless you see an uh, uh, explicit kufr. Yeah, so, uh, or, 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 or a masiyah, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, explicit, it's not open to dispute. Uh, and so therefore, in that context, um, where the ruler has not fulfilled his role, uh, uh, of course, the ummah have a right, because the ummah have not appointed a person, uh, uh, you know, um, the purpose is not uh, just appointment, and we've ticked that box and we'll, we'll box and we'll fulfill our responsibility. No. Uh, the responsibility is continuous. So where the ruler fails to fulfill his responsibility, he should be accounted. And if he complete, yeah, and if he contravenes Sharia in an explicit manner, he should be removed. And where there's a dispute about this issue, yeah, as the ayah says, in tanazatun fi shayin, faraduhu illallahi wa rasul. That if you dispute a matter, refer it to Allah and His Messenger, which means adjudication, which means that a qadi. Uh, you, you know, so the matter will be raised with the Qadi, will look into the issue and will make a determination uh, uh, as to whether the Khalifa can continue or his contract should be annulled. Iyad Hilal, what about competency? So um, the condition to remove a Khalifa seems to be on uh, his uh, ability to implement Islam and uh, the clear kufr, the kufr bua, which is seen in his actions and in his rulings. But what about if the, the Khalifa implements Islam, uh, but implements it really poorly and uh, looks after the people, but looks after it in a very haphazard or an inadequate way? Uh, what about that example that Kamal cited of a Khalifa who was like Bolsonaro or Trump? Uh, he uh, he uh, uh, deals with the COVID uh, 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 pandemic by, uh, telling people to mix in public and you know we've we've had this we've had um, you know Muslim scholars who have said that um, it's ludicrous that you should break the jama in the mosque and and you should separate people in the mosque and in such a imagine if that person was the Khalifa then of course there would be mass deaths I mean is that an enough of a reason to remove a Khalifa from office incompetency I mean we need to keep in mind that the political philosophy in Islam is based on two principles, Brother Kamal mentioned. Sovereignty belongs to the Sharia. 
and the authority belongs to the Ummah. So the Khalifa cannot jump over the Sharia or over the Ummah. Uh, Hassan al-Basri, in one of his advices to Umar Amr ibn Hubayra, he told him, Umar ibn Hubayra was Umayyah's governor, and he told that Hassan al-Basri and some other that the Umayyah's caliph is, or, uh, is chosen by God, and he is ordering the, uh, the, him as governor to do this and this, and whatever I do is the Qadr, because God is chosen him, so what to do? So Hassan al-Basri, of course, told him that the Sultan is chosen, the authority, the power, the, the, the ruling, is defined to serve people. So don't use the deen, the religion, and the Sultan, the ruling, to subjugate people. So the Sultan or the Caliph or the Amir cannot be above the, those two principles. Sharia is the sovereign and the Ummah has the authority. In this, we need to know what is the role of the caliph, like what, we, what was mentioned earlier, and how the caliph can be chosen. If we agree that the ummah must choose the caliph, and the bay'ah is not ritual, but it is real contract, a contractual agreement between people and between the, uh, the caliph to rule them based on certain conditions. Now, can there be a, a term limit or not? This can be open for debate. So let's say if there is term limit, then within this term limit, as long as the caliph functions in the right way, dis discharges the responsibility in the right way, then that's fine. If there is a dispute, like the brother Kamal mentioned, go to the ayah. What does the ayah say? Uh, in the case of, of COVID, no, it's not his responsibility, it's not his authority to do so, uh, claiming that this is a hukum sari. We have to pray in this way. Again, go back to the Sharia. What does Sharia say in the case of pandemic? If he ignores all of this, then the, the, the judge can, can just declare him doesn't fit, even if it is before his term ends. If there is no term limit, again, this does not mean that, we, that the caliph is our destiny, that we have to obey no matter what. No, we don't. There is no person has absolute right for obedience. The obedience is actually is very abused. It's very noble concept, and it brings uh, discipline in the society and in the life. But it is abused to say that to, to the point that you know some people say that the ruler is our destiny. That's it. You cannot even oppose. Him. You cannot. Op you cannot not revolt. You cannot oppose. You can't oppose openly, even if the ruler uh, commits zina, uh, and this zina was streamed online publicly for, uh, quote unquote, 30 minutes. We heard of this uh, shaykh who, who said such thing. That's not, that's not uh, the, the sharia. We'll refer him to what Al Hassan al Basri said. They are using the sharia and they are using the Islam, they are using the, the ruling to subjugate people. The Khalifa does not have open authority and does not have uh, absolute power. If, 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 if he shows incompetence, also to stand another, another issue, if he shows incompetence. Okay, he was chosen based on certain issues, but now we see that he is incompetent. Go back to the ayah, you know, and go to the justices to decide, does he fit or not? If they decide that he doesn't fit, you know, then their, their findings will be followed. But the point is how to establish this mechanism based on this political philosophy. This is the challenge which uh, is facing us. What kind of mechanism, what kind of system you need to impose or establish based on this political philosophy? Some people would say, yeah, do you, you have, you know, four, four, four elements will establish the foundation for the political system in Islam. That the sovereignty to the Sharia, authority to the Ummah, we must have just one caliph, and this caliph adopts the Ahkam Sharia. The first two, yes, there is no dispute that they are part of our political philosophy. The second, third point, choosing one caliph, well, this is common. This is more common in any political system. You will not find any political system says that we choose two heads of the state. Go to the American Constitution, talks about a president, not presidents, uh, 
go ruling at the same time. Go to the Britain, you talk about the monarchy. And the monarchy delegates the authority to the prime minister in a parliamentary system. So every system just has one, one head of state. So this is not unique to Islam, actually. And the adoption of the rules, every system must adopt, we must have certain process through which certain laws will be declared to be the law of the land. And the same thing applies to Islam. But if we keep thinking of the caliph being the holy cow, that he is untouchable, that he is our destiny, yes, it will be, oh, that will open the doors for, for, for uh, dictatorship, for authoritarianism, and it, the, the state or the government, the government or the caliphate will not function in a healthy way. Well, there's some really interesting ideas in what Iyad Hilal just said there. So, uh, and, and, and it's really a follow-on from what you described as the contract between, uh, it's almost a contract of uh, wakala, a contract of representation, uh, where you're employing a khalifa to discharge his duties, because only he, head of state, can discharge those duties. Now, uh, Iyad Hilal talked about a contract. Um, I want you to f- uh, focus on that for a second. I mean, can this contract be entrenched? So um, uh, by entrenchment, I mean that even the Khalifa is bound by it, because uh, until now, uh, contemporary discourse on the Caliphate seems to imply that the Khalifa is not bound by any decision of his predecessor, or any decision of the Ummah. And so if the Khalifa decided to change the constitution, that's perfectly valid. If the Khalifa decided that uh, that um, uh, entrench, uh, an entrenched position, he, he chose not to be bound by that position, he could change that position. Um, is there a precedence for entrenchment? And can a Khalifa be entrenched by, uh, by a certain set of norms or laws? The description of the contract uh, or the bay'ah as wakala is, is something even classical scholars have discussed. So um, Ibn Taymiyyah in his Siyasa Shari'iyya, uh, he described it uh, uh, as, as, as wakala. And in fact, he made similar points that we were making that, you know, that the ruler, whoever is appointed, needs to fulfill that wakala, that role and responsibility in the best way possible uh, for the person who has appointed him. Now, um, problem is that when we look at this issue of contract, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, a, a history and 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 past fiqh on this issue, and the way it's been looked at is is that look, um, the caliph was appointed, uh, and in history, uh, the bayah was just a rubber stamp, a ceremonial, uh, just like the queen, uh, you know, or when a monarch. Uh, you know, in, in, in the UK, for example, uh, is appointed. It's just a ceremony. It doesn't really mean there's no power being transferred. Whereas the bay'ah is actually a, a, a executive power which is transferred by the people uh, because they are the holders of that power uh, that Allah has given them, that authority, and they appoint a ruler to execute that on their behalf. So uh, from a contract law perspective in Sharia, um, uh, those, you know, that means that in the contract, the people can actually stipulate conditions um, uh, as long as those conditions are do not contravene what is in the Kitab and the Sunnah. Uh, and the Khalifa is uh, bound to follow. Now, we know in the past that, you know, um, there were no term limits. So when a Khalifa died, another Khalifa was appointed. But that doesn't mean that is uh, part of the system uh, or, you know, the way things were does not indicate a Sharia prescription. Although there is interpretation that, you know, that this is an example of Ijma. But where is the the Dalil uh, to indicate that this is Wajib? Um, In the absence of that, we fall back to general contract law. And if we follow that, then the Ummah have actually a, a right to put a, any condition with the Sharia, does not contravene the Sharia, and the Khalifa is bound to follow that. And even historically, actually, we can see even the time of uh, when uh, Uthman, عن, when he was appointed, uh, the, the two candidates, was, candidates were Uthman عن, and 
uh, Ali radiallahu an. Uh, and it was put to them that we will give bay'ah to whoever follows the ishtihad uh, of uh, those who came before uh, Umar, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah. And it was Uthman who said that I will follow the ishtihad of my predecessors. Ali said no. So it was on that basis that the uh, people gave uh, Uthman bay'ah. So therefore, Uthman al-An, yeah, you know, he became Khalifa with that contract and with those shurut and those conditions. And so therefore, uh, you know, those conditions have to be honored uh, because that came with the contract. So yes, so uh, if the Ummah decide, uh, you see, the question is wrong. Does the Khalifa decide the constitution? No. It's the Ummah who decide the constitu constitution. And if they put certain conditions uh, and, and, and certain um, restrictions in that contract, which does not contradict Sharia, then the Khalifa who is appointed and who is hired for that role will have to honor and respect those conditions. So even if uh, a condition was to put a time limit on, as uh, Iyad Hilal mentioned, a time limit on the duration of the term of the Khalifa, the Khalifa will be bound by that time limit? Yes, because uh, it, where does it say, uh, you know, explicitly in Sharia that the role of the Khalifa is for life? In fact, contract law, uh, generally no contract is for life. There's always an end or, or there's some provision for that contract to end. Um, uh, it's only um, if there's any other delil which stipulates that then, uh, you know, you can say that um, it, it is for life. Just because it happened that way, just because um, uh, the Khulafa, you know, were, the next Khalifa was appointed either because he died or he was assassinated, does not mean that that is a hukum shari'i that we are bound to follow. The hukum shari'i, just like how you appoint a ruler, there is no prescription. If you look at how Abu Bakr was appointed, how Umar was appointed, Uthman, Ali, each of them, there is a variation. And none of those are actually, and all the Sahaba accepted those variations. That, so that doesn't mean that those are templates, you know, like a nominate contract, that we are bound to follow this template. So, so was there a principle behind, a, a guiding principle behind these four models of appointing a Khalifa? Yeah, the fundamental is that the Sultan al Ummah, that the Ummah have authority and they have the right to appoint the, uh, the Khalifa. So the mechanism in the process that could be through the Ahlul Halli Wal Aqad, that could be um, through a, 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 a Shura, uh, the Shura Council could do that, that could be through a wider electorate where the whole Ummah engages in the process. Uh, that is the Hukum Shari. The Hukum Shari is that the Ummah appoints, whether it's through their representatives or they do it through directly, that is not part of this. The mechanism is not in stone. What's uh, written in stone in Sharia is that the Ummah appoint. So on the point of the term limits, there is nothing explicit as far as I'm aware, which says that uh, just because historically things happened in a certain way that we are bound. Historically, we have uh, we had um, uh, dynasties, you know, fa families. You have Banu Umayyah, Banu Abbas, the Mamalik, you know, and, and, and the, the Uthmani rule. Uh, there's nothing in Sharia which says that we are beholden to those historical models, but rather what we should do is look at the asl. Uh, what was uh, the ahkam that uh, was enunciated by the Quran, the Sunnah, and, you know, what is the example from the ijma that we are obliged to follow? Because if you look at even the Sahaba, uh, you know, they followed, uh, uh, you know, Umu, Ali radhi anhu was not willing to follow the example, you know, the ishtihad of um, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar. He reserved the right not to follow. Uthman said, I will follow. So, you know, so, so this is a matter left open to the Ummah. And this is where we need to, as an Ummah, uh, we need to discuss that what kind of bespoke uh, constitutional framework or a constitutional caliphate will serve our needs such that we as an ummah can live by sharia and live by Islam uh, and apply Islam in the best manner possible. Can I add something? Yes, please, please. First of all, you know, of course, I agree with what Brother Kamal mentioned, just maybe a little fine tuning to or 
clarifying some points. For the still the assumption that the ruler is this and that, we think of the ruler as if the ruler is God's shade on the earth, as if the ruler is holy, the ruler is sacred cow. The ruler is what Abu Bakr Siddiq said, I became the wali al-amr, but I'm not the best. Doesn't have to be the best from among us. So he can have mistakes. He is not infallible. He is not absolute. Define the authority like we, maybe you can. You need a constitution, uh, written or non-written. The constitution doesn't have to be written one uh, to 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 shape the relationship between the, especially the rulers and and the citizens. Regarding the term limit, which is very important. Number one, like what Brother Kamal said it rightly, if you look at the bay'ah as a contract, you can add any stipulation you want. The Ummah wants you to be the ruler for this amount of year. Or the other on the constitution, it depends on the on the contract which was uh, signed with the caliph when he became chosen, when he was chosen as a caliph. Now, those who say, no, there should be no term limit, they bring us two examples, two evidences, actually. Number one, the Ijma, Ijma al-Sahaba, on Abu Bakr, on Umar, on Uthman, no, no term limit. And then the second one, the hadith that talk about the way that will obey the ruler as long as the ruler is obeying God. So in the first example, the Ijma, there is no term limit. In the second one, the obedience is limited to certain condition, not to certain time. For the ijma, we need to define what is the subject of ijma. What did the Sahaba agree on? Did they agree on the permissibility of not having time limit? Or did they agree on the prohibition of having term limit? The minimum which we are sure about is the first. Their agreement, their ijma, is that it is permissible. It is an option. You know, you can have the the constitution in stating that there is no term limit, but it's not mandatory. It's not uh, haram, invalid to add term limit. The, you cannot use the ijma to say that it invalidates the term limit at all. Uh, because in the ijma, we need to define what is the subject of ijma. Let me just give another similar example. We know in the life of, in the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar al Khattab. They differed on certain issues on how to distribute uh, public fund. Abu Bakr Siddiq was of the view that public fund should be distributed equally to all people, no matter what, when did you become Muslim or your seniority in Islam or not. And Umar Khattab said, no, I would distribute fund based on the seniority. So in the days of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar Khattab implemented the views of Abu Bakr and the Sahaba agreed on that. When Umar ibn Khattab became caliph, he distribute, started distributing based on seniority and the Sahaba agreed on this. The Sahaba would not agree on two different views at all at the same time. All what it can mean, the common thing factor that between both cases, which the Sahaba agreed on, is that the caliph will be implementing the rule that the caliph sees that it is proper. So they gave that authority to Abu Bakr and they gave that authority to Umar. So from this, we conclude the ijma that it is up to the caliph to, to, to change. But if you agree with him that he will not change, then he cannot change because it is in the st a stipulation in the contract. Now, regarding the, the hadith that tell us to obey as long as they obey the ma ata'atullah fikum or ma aqamu fikum, as long as they uh, establish the hukum shari'i or obey me as long as I'm obeying God's law, it doesn't mean forever. It can be as long as I obey me within those five years or six years, as long as I am doing it right. So there is no conflict between having term limit and between the obedience uh, that is needed uh, and which is one of principles in the Islamic in, in the Islamic governance. Keep in mind that the historical precedents are not binding. As an example, uh, the caliphs used to hire 
or to appoint a governor for a long period of time. And now you will say, wait a minute, this, you know, is maybe not the right way to, 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 give, to appoint them for, for a long period of time, but rather you appoint them for limited time. If you allow this for the governor, what's the difference between the governor? The governor is ruler and between the caliph. The point is the discussion about this Ahkam Sultaniyya should not be done based on a certain frame that I, I, I previously believe in, and that's it. The discussion should be candid based on the, the methodology of understanding the Ahkam Sharia, based on the methodology of Usul al fiqh based on methodology of how to understand the text. Kamal, um... I want you to paint a picture for me of what life would be like in a caliphate, in a true Islamic government. Now, we really experience two types of models in the world. Uh, we experience American style liberal democracy and various shades of liberal democracies across Europe. And you and I have, have lived in the UK and, and we, uh, we, uh, we know about uh, what it means to live in a liberal democratic society with all of its hypocrisies. It has, uh, you know, it, it enshrines within law a series of freedoms. And, you know, uh, yes, of course, there is a, uh, but, you know, the state is, is gradually becoming uh, more and more inflated and, and has more of an impact on people's lives. But at least the philosophy is about the state uh, should stay out of the ordering lives of people. And then you have the Chinese style uh, government of a Russian style authoritarianism. And, and uh, those systems are it, 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 very intrusive and they uh, pry into the private lives of, of people and they set prices and they, uh, they um, interfere in the economy and they uh, uh, create a, a social life where in its extreme, you are monitored on a very daily basis. Um, with those two systems in mind, how would you place the Islamic Caliphate system? It's actually a big question in terms of, you know, many aspects that we can look at. Uh, but if I were to just um, focus on one issue, uh, which is the, you know, uh, whether you have an open society or a closed society, uh, whether you have a society where there's civic engagement uh, and, you know, uh, and uh, there's a lot of checks and balances, if you like, yeah, uh, which you, you know, which is alleged with all these issues. But the premise in liberal democracies is that the separation of powers, the rule of law, uh, and, you know, there is, uh, you know, uh, that there is an engagement of the people with the system. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of checks and balances. Whereas uh, with the Chinese or the Russian model, you have, you know, that the focus is on the ruler and it's very centralized. So whatever decision is made in the center, uh, you know, that is applied throughout. Uh, so you, you don't have the concept of diffusion of power that we see in the sort of American model, which we're going to focus on that, where you have a federal system, uh, you know, the government is a bicameral, bicameral system where, uh, you know, the legislature is completely, uh, you know, is divided even in, in further. So um, the House of Representatives will make the rules and you need the Senate, uh, need to pass in the Senate as well. Um, uh, so, uh, so you have a lot of engagement there with the Chinese model. You have, if you like, efficiency because, uh, you know, it's centralized, whatever that is decided at the center, that is applied throughout. Now, in both of them, there are aspects which are, um, you know, uh, 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 that, that the Sharia would, uh, you know, countenance. But I think the issue is the trade-off. Where do you draw the line? So in, in, in an Islamic caliphate, you, had, you would have engagement. Uh, you would have checks and balances. It's not completely centralized or shouldn't be completely centralized where, uh, where the people do not have a role. But however, if you have, uh, you know, if you burden the process of government with so many checks and balances, as we see in the American system, that you have gridlock, lock jam, and hardly anything gets done, you know, and that also has negatives. And also, uh, although they claim, you know, uh, they are bipartisan in terms of 
pushing their policies, but you find it's very partisan uh, on, on every matter and it's difficult to get things done. Uh, whereas in the Chinese model, you can, you know, because whatever the ruler decides, you can. Uh, for us, um, there are checks and balances. Um, uh, the way I view a, a caliphate is a constitutional caliphate where, as I, we discussed before, the ummah have the authority uh, and appoint the ruler to look after their affairs. And that responsibility is continuous and there's a continuous engagement uh, with the ruler and with the government. Uh, and also there's means of redress where there's injustice and where, you know, um, where you have, uh, you know, the Mazalim courts or the other courts will deal with uh, where the disputes occur. However, uh, I believe that when we look at the constitutional framework, that the checks and balances should not actually uh, overburden or get in the way of efficient government. So there is engagement. However, the final Amrul Imami Yarfa'ul Khilaf, the final word will remain with the Khalifa, who, when he makes a decision, that will be uh, applied throughout uh, the jurisdiction uh, of the Islamic Caliphate. So, so on this particular question, so there is engagement. Uh, there are checks and balances, but not to the extent that, um, you know, that, that it affects the efficient running of government and governance and, and looking after the interests uh, of the people at large. Yeah, Hilal, one, one final question, and maybe Kamal, you want to uh, give your perspective on this, and that is on the issue of punishments and hudu. Now, I uh, had many questions on the subject, and it's a difficult subject, especially in, in the modern era, that uh, some of the Islamic punishments are very harsh and uh, they are harsh in, 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 by modern standards, those for like that. And, and even some Muslims find uh, these punishments to be, uh, in, in inverted commas, problematic to the degree that some scholars have argued that the hudud could no longer be applied in, in the modern era because it's uh because uh because of the many conditions that apply to it and and the various alternatives that are available to uh dealing with uh, uh to with dealing with criminal activity i mean how, where do you see uh the, these punishments in an islamic caliphate uh Robert yard yes first of all let's keep in mind a few points point number one human mind or human reason or human intellect has certain important role in understanding the situation, the waqa, and understanding the text, and uh, utilizing uh, linguistic and usul rules to understand the text and relating the text to the waqa. All of this is done by human beings, not by a machine. There is no machine ishtihad. And this ishtihad can be subject to give and take. The role of the human mind or human intellect is not to tell us what action is halal, what action is haram. The categorization, this categorization is within the sovereignty of Sharia. And Umar ibn Khattab, we keep bringing him as an example, Allahumma al He carries the responsibility of uh, the head of the state. So there was one time a famine, Maja'a, Am Ramada, and he did not apply the punishment of uh, the theft crime because now there is shubha, there is a reasonable doubt that the, the thief will be given. You know, the, the thief will be given this reasonable doubt. Yeah, maybe he stole for his survival. So he did not actually suspend the, the implementation, but rather he understood the illa behind the implementation and applied to that situation. The other point which we need to keep in mind is that the, these penal codes, uh, they are not the Sharia. They are part of the Sharia. I like the term that was given by uh, Rahimahullah, Shaykh Mustafa Zarqa. Uh, he used to tell us that these uqubat are mu'ayyidat. They are not the basic. He says mu'ayyidat means supporting, supporting rules. There are certain rules applied defined by the Sharia, as an example, the human, uh, the personal property should be protected. Uh, you cannot 
attack others property these are ahkam sharia but there they, these ahkam sharia will remain theoretical without without another rules that will support them show us how can we implement these rules so the, he calls them muayyidat somehow we shifted to the muayyidat to the aqubat to the penal code and we forget about the ahkam sharia as an example in no way to implement the theft uh, crime punishment without applying the economic, uh, Islamic policy in the economy. If there is need, like Umar al-Khattab did, you don't apply it. So those ahkam sharia are not meant as an objective by themselves, but rather they are meant to maintain and support the original rules. So the focus should be on the sharia. How can the sharia be implemented? Regarding the harsh punishment and non quote unquote non harsh punishment, it can be right if my mind or your mind is to tell which hukum sharia should be followed. And even if in this case I was reading a PhD, I think either PhD or master's degree uh, thesis written by uh, American who used to serve in the law enforcement agency and his thesis was about the physical punishment. Should it be in, in, implemented, followed in the American uh, judicial system or not? And his point is, yes, it should be. You should uh, apply uh, jeld, uh, lashing the, some people in certain crimes, certain punishment. It's much better than putting them in the jail. Just to add to what um, Abu Tariq was saying, I think the problem is, is the caricature uh, that is presented uh, in in terms of the hudud uh, and and how is uh, how is uh, uh, you know implemented. So you do have misapplication in certain Muslim countries, and also the media uh, will pick on these examples, uh, and and so therefore there's a loss of um, thicker or confidence among some Muslims that well, how you know how can these things work uh, in the you know modern day and age? And as Abu Tariq you know, explain that, you know, this, rather than shying away from this discussion, we should discuss, look, there is a high evidential burden that has to be met, uh, you know, and there's rules, regulations, uh, uh, you know, this is not something that these, these can be implemented devoid of a context and, 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 and rules and, 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 and conditions that have to be met before such rules are applied and the hudud uh, don't, you know, criminal law or penal uh, system does not define the whole of the Sharia. Sharia is much larger. However, one point I do want to um, just focus on this issue is, I think the problem people have is not um, the harshness that they are pointing to is not necessarily the death penalty, because the death penalty exists in America, and that's something people can relate to with us. The Quran says, "Walakum fil qisasi haya," that in the law of retribution, you know, there is haya life. In other words, this is protecting life. The purpose is not to punish people. The Sharia and the, uh, you know, the hudud are not there to, um, you know, just exact revenge or exact pain for people without a higher purpose. Uh, the punishment there is actually for uh, rehabilitation, deterrence, uh, and also for a wholesome society. And this is where I think people, you know, people, the, you know, those of a liberal persuasion, their liberal sensitivities are sort of, they feel it's impinged on with the hudud because in the social relationships, they feel, why is there such harsh rules? Uh, ethics and morality, uh, why is it coming into, uh, uh, you know, in that realm? For, for us as Muslims, ethics and morality is not only in one sphere. It is in our trade, it is in our business, it is in our politics. Even in a liberal democracy, they will say that, look, for example, you know, in the practice of law, you have ethics, you have morality, um, you know, and you have regulatory bodies, actually rules and sections to ensure that ethics and morality, uh, you know, um, honesty, integrity, even in politics, they say, you know, in theory, there should be honesty and integrity and public service. Um, however, uh, the West, what they do is when it comes to social relationships, they say, well, people are free, so therefore there should be no rules or regulations. For us, uh, in terms of how men and women interact, 
the relationship between spouses, the relationship between uh, you know families and in the public sphere, that actually also the morality and the ethics needs to be protected there. So the separation that the West has between these other matters and the social mores is an artificial one. And you know, for us, you know, morality actually spans the whole of uh, human um, behavior and, and, and conduct and includes the social affairs. And it is there for the betterment of society. And if we were to engage in that conversation and show how actually it protects families, protect family values, it protects a wholesome atmosphere where we can bring our children up. Uh, that's what Hudud is about. Hudud is not about uh, causing pain and misery then I think people will appreciate this uh, topic even better, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, uh, Iyad Hilal and Kamal Hussain. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful discussion we had today, and I think it clarified a lot of matters on Islamic governance. Jazakallah khair for your time today. Ayyakum.